Welcome to Jersey Reads the Classics, an audiobook podcast delving into the finest works of our literary masters. Unfortunately, it's read by this woman. What the hell? Who cares? Let's go on an adventure. Hello and welcome back to Jersey Reads the Classics with me, your house, Rosie Tacandia. Well, my friends, welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I don't know if there's four of you, three of you, who of you, even one of you. I appreciate you and thank you so much for sitting here and, you know, enjoying, hopefully enjoying a little bit of the entertainment that I hope to relay to people. Because at this point, during this time, whatever's going on in the world, I will not be held captive to it. I'm still going to bring love and light and all that good shit out there. So I hope you're feeling it. Anyway, I digress. As you know, we are reading a very classic Christmas tale of Christmas Carol. And when we left off last episode, where Scrooge has now encountered oof, the phantom, the ghost of the Christmas future. That thing don't talk. We don't know. It doesn't even have a face. It just has one outstretched hand. He has not said one word, and I don't think he talks at all. And we went into the future, and some dude is dead, and everybody's talking ill of this guy. But Scrooge thinks it's Scrooge has no idea who it is, so Scrooge is still waiting to see the appearance of him, like he's a changed man. But no. And then after we've heard all these people badmouth this man, they don't even want to go to his freaking funeral. They can't talk. They don't even like the man. They then go to this warehouse where these like people have all these tattered things in there i don't know they're in a room so we left it off we have uh two women and two men in some room and it's like this big disgusting warehouse in like the slums of the city of london so that is where we left off and as you know i will probably read a couple of lines before the story just so you can get back in the flow of things all right so let us proceed to a christmas carol by charles dickens Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it, you couldn't have met in a better place, said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlor. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two aren't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, how it screaks. There and such a rusty bit of metal in the place as its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. Ha <laughs> ha! We're all suitable to our calling. We're all well matched. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlor. Okay, so let's see what's going to happen with all these people coming into the parlor. The parlor was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. While he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with the bold defiance of the other two. What odds then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true indeed, said the laundress. No man more so. Why then? Don't stand staring as if you was afraid, woman. What's the wiser? Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dilber and the man together. We should hope not. Very well then, cried the woman. That's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dilber, laughing. <laughs> if he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw pursued the woman. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd had somebody look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying, gasping out his last there alone by himself. Oh, shit. Someone did done die, that same man, and he, they got his stuff. Oh, damn, let's see what they're talking about. It's the truest word that ever was spoke, said Mrs. Dilber. It's a judgment on him. 
I wish it was a little heavy a judgment, replied the woman. And it should have been, you may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid to let them see it. We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in faded black mounting the breach first produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value. Is it a brooch or a brooch? I think it's a brooch. Okay, and a brooch of no great value at all. They were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall and added them up into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. That's your account, said Joe, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dilber was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's why I ruin myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. Old Joe means what he says and says what he means. And now undo my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. Joe went down his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this, said Joe? Bed curtains. Ah, returned the woman laughing and leaning forward on her crossed arms. Bed curtains. You don't mean to say you tuck them down, rings and all, with him lying there, said Joe. Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, said Joe, and you'll certainly do it. Oh, my God. So they stole all this stuff from the dead guy's place. Didn't care that he was, she was, he was lying there. She took the red curtains from around his bed while the dead body was there. He wasn't even cold yet. I want to know how she knew he died. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out for the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coolly. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets, asked Joe? Whose else's do you think, replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Said old Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Yeah, they want to make sure there's no plague because, you know, there's something he can be catchy. And in those days, you know, it wasn't like, well, today you can catch shit too. But he's just like, listen, woman, I don't want the plague on my hands. Anyway, where are we? Okay. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through the shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it, asked old Joe. Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure, replied the woman with the laugh. <laughs> Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. Ah, the bitch even stole the clothing from the guy's body. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. <laughs> Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror as they sat grouped about their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp. He viewed them with a distation and disgust. Oh my God, distation. Dest yeah, detestation. Oh, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust because he detests them which could hardly have been greater though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself ha <laughs> <laughs> laughed the same woman when old joe producing a flannel bag with money in it told out their several gains upon the ground this is the end of it you see he frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead <laughs> Damn, they don't care even this dead person's getting everything stolen. Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to toe. I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed. A bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covered up 
which though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. Well, how poetic. So there's something there. Oh, God, he's in his room where these people stole all this shit. And now let's see. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do and longed to do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. Oh shit, he don't want to see who's under the veil, under the, the sheet. He knows, he knows, he just don't want to see it because then it's real. Oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death set upon thine altar here and dress it with such terrors as thou hast as thy command, for this is thy dominion. But as a loved, revered, and honored head, thou canst not turn one hair to thy dread purposes or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open generous and true, the heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse is a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice, hard dealing, griping cares? They have brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in the dark, empty house with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind to me in this or that. And for the memory of one kind word, I will be kind to him. Meaning that shit was alone. Whoever's dead, they are dead. They are going nowhere. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of gnawing grass beneath the hard stone, hard stone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Yeah, the rats want to eat the body. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me, let us go. Still, the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it if I could. But I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there is a person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized, show that person to me, spirit. I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried, but in vain, to work with her needle and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. Oh, shit. Scrooge won't take off the, the, uh, the sheet, because he don't want to know, but he knows. At length, the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed and which he struggled to repress. Oh shit, he's happy even though he knows he shouldn't be. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire. And when she asked him faintly, what news? Which was not until after a long silence. He appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good, she said, or bad to help him? Bad, he answered. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said amazed, there is. Nothing to past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face spoke truth, but she was thankful in her soul to hear it. And she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry but the first was the emotion of a heart. What the half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me turns out to have been quite true. 
He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know, but before that time, we shall be ready with the money. And even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, soften as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood were brighter. And it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Shit. So this guy who's died with nothing, his death has brought other people good emotions because they don't have to pay the debt they owe him. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit, which we left just now, will be forever present to me. I'm leaving it there. I love how I'm leaving it all in suspense, right? Um, We've all figured out who the dead guy is, right? We all know. Do we know? I'm not going to tell you. I think you know. If you've seen the show, you know who the dead guy is, you know. Was a money launderer, you know, money lender, and all this other stuff, and no one likes him. And they stole his bed curtains. But the truth is this: Scrooge don't want to see the truth. Scrooge knows the truth. It's him. He didn't want to pull up the sheet. He knows his own bedroom. He knows his shit. When they were unveiling shit, they're just not telling us that because really deep down, he knows the truth. His spirit knows, and he's seeing it for what it is. His death meant nothing to anybody except people that don't have to pay his debt back right, right, don't have to pay their debt back to him right now. So that's the legacy, my friend. This is the legacy. Scrooge, with all his money, no one has said a kind word about him. No one is rejoicing. Like, no one, people are rejoicing, actually, and no one could give a shit. And he's alone, and that's it. You know, that's the thing. We all think when we pay us, we're not, we think, what do we think we're doing? I don't know. I guess some people, and you don't have to believe that there's a soul's journey. It's fine too if you think that you die and that's it. But the thing is, the legacy is this. What do people say about you? It says a lot about you. There are people that have nothing. They have no worldly possessions and they did so much good for the world. The whole world, the people, so many people revere them. Whether you're Mother Teresa or you're the guy next door who's been volunteering his whole life and taking care of people from day one and doing a kind human being and then, then all of a sudden his funeral parlor when he passes away in a hundred years is filled with people because all they could say is how amazing he was or she was. So that's the point in life. Each day, my mom always says to me, if we each thought about death three times a day, and maybe now we are because of COVID, we would change who we are. We'd be better people. So this is a not about guilt and shame. This is just a reminder that your actions, your words, the way you leave a situation, the way you leave others is really your legacy, my friends. So right now, let's all leave a legacy of kindness and love and good heartedness spirit. This is the time to make the change if you want to, if there's something really bugging you about you, or if you're really a great human being, continue to know that your legacy, what you've done for others, who you are has not gone unnoticed. You may not be told every day, you saved my life. I'm really grateful for you. I appreciate you. But just know, my friends, that everything we do or say has an impact. Every action has a consequence. Every action has a reaction. And though sometimes in life, when we're human, we're going to be upset. We're going to have shit that we've said. We're going to have things that we've done. But unintentionally, is different. Also, if you feel like you've done something wrong and you want to own up to it, own up to it. Ask for forgiveness. You know, the person, it's on them if they don't want to forgive you. Also, my thing is this. Let's just know that, you know, anything we say to someone or do to someone, it will stick with them, whether it's good or bad. So let's choose. Before we ever say something that we think may not be in the best interest of somebody, I always say stop and think. You know they say stop or think before you talk? That These adages are there for a reason because that one thing that you say to somebody and if it's a child or an adult or a family member or a friend or your partner, it can stick with them for life and it could do some major damage. So instead of that, think and be constructive with whatever you need to say. Now, with that being said, I'm not saying take someone else's abuse and not, you know, hold your own. But you can hold your own in a confrontation or if there's an argument with light and love too. And so I just want to encourage all of us to continue to find the good in ourselves, the good in each other, and to continue to spread the good word and to be kind to one another. And I get it. You're sitting there going, people are acting a fool. People are acting crazy. You're right. But remember, 
Two wrongs don't make a right. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't do any good. And I understand sometimes we're angry and that's okay too. But I think today we got to combat the energy that's out there of ill will and craziness with staying with light and love and knowing that whatever we do has a consequence and every action has a reaction. So let's stay in a place of light and love and put that forth out there. Because at this point, the world could use all of our light and love. Let's lift the vibration. See, that horn is beeping to just affirm that. That was a symbol. That was a sign. That was a sign from the phantom or the ghost of Christmas presents to say, let's send out light and love. Because you know what, my friends? We cannot change what's going on around us. We cannot, unless we're activists. And of course, if you want to do that, that's great too. But you can change it. You know how you can change it? By how you approach others. And if somebody is nasty to you, Send them light and love and walk away. I think that is really the best thing, and especially today, because too many people are doing terrible things. If you speak up in the wrong way, they suddenly, they want to hurt you. It's not worth it, my friends. But also right now, even from your own home, even if you want to send light and love, light and love to the world right now, that's healing vibration. It's a healing frequency, and the world could use that right now. So with that being said, I'm sending you healing light and love, sending you tons of light and love and peace and joy and bliss and magic and many times and abundance and prosperity and all that good stuff. Knowing as I send it to you, I receive it gladly and gratefully and lovingly. Also knowing that right here, right now, right here, right now, you are enough, you are worthy, you are loved, and someone is thinking about you in a good way, trust me. And my friends, as always, it's always been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until we read again and again and again and again. <laughs>